Welcome. Delight to be here again. <laughs> and I get to talk about one of my favorite topics, and that's the Aramaic teachings of the man named Yeshua. When I introduced the Aramaic, a couple of folks who were over at Unity this morning heard me talk about this. I, I like to tell a story that illustrates the real meaning and the reason why the Aramaic is so important. And uh, let's imagine that you happen to be the best translator of Russian into English and English into Russian in the world. And a man from Russia hears that we're doing a workshop here. And he contacts John and says, John, I'd like to come to the workshop, but I don't speak any English. And John knows that you have an extra room in your home and asks if you'd be willing to pick this fellow up at the airport, translate for him, and house him while he's here, which you do. We get together with this gentleman. We have dinner once or twice through the week, and, you know, we just have a really good time with him. And at the end of the week, I don't speak any Russian, so I want to let, I ask you if you'll let this man know that, you know, I think he's really cool. And as you're taking him to the airport, you turn to him in your best Russian, and you tell him that Michael thinks he's got a low body temperature. <laughs> you accurately translated what I said, but you didn't say a word about what I meant. And thus begins the problem with Western Christianity. The man named Yeshua spoke, thought, and taught in the Aramaic language. If he sat in most places in the Western world that supposedly are speaking about him, he'd say, that's all Greek to me. <laughs> because Greek thought has been put into his mouth. And, you know, people are hungry, hungry, hungry for answers and they'll fall for anything because they don't have a clue what's going on if they've been taught through Greek teachings and through Greek thought. The core teachings are lost because the Aramaic language is a very idiomatic language. And it's interesting, Jeannie and I were in Europe. We did six or seven countries a couple of years ago. And about the third country I started to think about, you know, as I'm listening, we were in uh, Sweden and, uh, and I hear these people speaking Swedish, and they're actually kind of understanding each other. And I didn't understand a word. And what clicked for me, because when I spoke English, Jeannie and I understood each other, but they didn't understand a word, the ones that didn't speak English. I was like, ah, this is Babel. This is the Tower of Babel. It's language. Yeshua says the power of life and death is in your words. And every language on the planet is Babel, except Aramaic. Interesting, if you look into the Aramaic alphabet, the Aramaic letters, those letters are actually 3D projected shadows of the spinning of the atomic structure of the elements. The Aramaic language is, is based in the elemental form of the creation. There's not another language that does that. And so the rest of us make up grunts and groans. We call them words, and we say they mean things. And as long as we have the same meanings, we can kind of communicate. We actually do a, a whole workshop called Communication. Did you hear what I think I said? And uh, <laughs> if you don't have the same brain cells firing, you, know, you, you actually think you hear the words someone else is speaking, but I've actually never spoken a word in my life. And you know, people say, Michael, you're a good speaker. I've never spoken a word in my life. Neither of you. I have a little flap of skin here that I know how to vibrate, and it causes air molecules to vibrate, but that's all I'm doing. Those air molecules vibrating move across the room, amplified by a microphone coming out of a little plastic cone somewhere in the room, and that causes air molecules to vibrate to cause a drum in your ear to vibrate. And when the drum in your ear vibrates, there's not a sound that goes in your ear. You know, that old question, if nobody's in the forest to hear the tree fall, does it make a sound? No. No tree falling has ever made a sound. Sound comes from the brain. So when that little drum moves, it causes bones to move that set up an electrical impulse, and that electrical impulse causes brain cells to fire. And whatever fires in brain cells constitutes your listening. The only language on the planet that's based in the listening that comes from the elemental universe is Aramaic. There's so many things that cannot be said in that language. 
when you actually get to his language and you hear the instructions that he gives, he gives a set of tools for how to have a direct personal experience, personally experience, of functioning as the presence of love in the world. Now, if you're trying to get that experience from someone who hasn't had that experience, good luck. And most people are vulnerable because they desperately want that experience but have no idea how to get there. There's an interesting passage in the scriptures, Luke 10, 25. And in this passage, uh, a scribe, now a scribe is someone who sits all day and writes and, you know, copies religious texts. So Yeshua, when he's asked this question, knows that the man already knows the answer. So there's some sort of trickery about it. So Luke 10, 25 says, and a scribe stood up to test him saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, again, he knows the man knows all the words of the scripture. So he says, well, what do the scriptures say? How do you read it? And the guy flaps his lip. He repeats, repeats, repeats words. He says, well, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. By the way, that's the Greek translation. That's not what he said at all. That's not what was said in Aramaic. And if you listen carefully, Yeshua has an interesting answer to the man. He doesn't say, that's right. Like, that's the answer to the question. He actually says, you spoke the truth. So the passage that the man parrots, Yeshua says, is the truth, but it's not the answer to the question he asked. Then what Yeshua does is he tells him what question his answer answers. And so the man speaks those words. He says, you, Yeshua replies, you spoke the truth. And then... Yeshua says to him, do this and you shall live. Now, what in effect he's saying to the man is, excuse me, sir, you have no business asking about eternal life. You're already dead. You can flap your lips about words. Remember he had people who came to him and he said, you come to me calling my name, telling me all about all the great works you've done, but your heart is far from me. Get away from me. What this man in effect is to saying to this man, to, to, uh, or what Yeshua is saying to this man is, sir, you have no business asking about eternal life. You have to come to life first in order to even inquire about that. How do you come to life? You live, and, and the Aramaic does not say love God, neighbor, and self, or as self. What the Aramaic says is, you must have rachma. There's not even a concept for the idea of rachma in Aramaic, in Greek, or Latin, or English. No such concept exists. He says you must have rachma when you think of the creator, when you think of neighbor, in order to maintain self. What is this self that he's talking about maintaining? Have you ever held a newborn child? How many have ever held a newborn? If you would, in one word, describe for me your newborn. Tap into the essence of the newborn. What word would you use to describe that newborn? Love? Awesome. awesome kind? Fresh, beautiful. Precious. Beautiful. Fresh. Fresh. Now, Jeannie and I, all over the globe, have asked tens of tens of thousands of people this question, and everybody's answer is some variation on the theme of love. And yet, where is it in the world? So in, in, in essence, or, or what this passage says in Aramaic is, there is, let's, let's expand it out, there is a gateway in the frontal lobes of your brain through which your human life, that essence, that created essence love that we just described, enters into human form. He didn't say love your neighbor. He said have rachma for your neighbor, the gateway with which human love, human life, enters your human form. 
And so by doing that in the presence of neighbor, by keeping that gateway open, you will maintain your human life. So he gives the man instructions on how to get a life first before he starts to move in the direction of eternal life. If you're not living with that, and, and, and go back to holding that newborn again, and ask yourself the question, is the newborn loving me, or is the newborn love? The newborn isn't loving you, the newborn is the presence of love, right? Right? Now, Vladimir Lenin says the way you destroy a culture is change the meaning of its words. Where is the culture of Yeshua? It's been pretty much disappeared because the meaning of virtually every key word in Yeshua's teachings has been changed. So we come in as this presence of love. The world does the best it can to knock it out of us. And then it sends us out. The kid sang about it a few decades ago. Looking for love in all the wrong places. Looking for love in too many faces. Thinking that you can get an experience of your essence from someone else is a fraud. But the world's taught you that love is a verb, something you can do to somebody, something you can get from somebody else, and it's a lie. Vladimir Lenin, change the meaning of the words, you can destroy the culture. Virtually every key word around Yeshua's core teachings has been changed by the Greeks, to mean something else. In this afternoon's workshop, for those that weren't here, we talked about forgiveness. And we looked at the idea that the Greeks have told us that forgiveness is about how I let you off the hook for what's happening inside of me. In, in the Aramaic language, the word forgive is the tool with which you go inside yourself and remove hostility or fear so that you can live in the experience of conscious, active, present love, your created nature. The words have been destroyed, almost every one of them. So the first order of business, if you're going to live as a human being, is you've got to have and experience yourself as the active presence of love. And then he gives five keys for how to maintain that experience. And the first key is the most important thing to know. My offering is, this is the most important thing to know about Yeshua's teachings. And if you've ever contemplated this particular passage from the scriptures, you might have wondered, what the heck are they talking about? Because we hear the words flowing from Yeshua, the eye is the lamp of the soul. If the light for you is darkness, how deep will your darkness become? Does that make any sense? If the light is, how can light be darkness? That just doesn't make any sense. Until you go back to the Aramaic and you understand what he was talking about. You know, there's some interesting Harvard research that says that in a time frame where there are 10,000 brain cells firing, 10,000 measurable units of electrical activity happening in the brain, the max amount of data that goes into conscious awareness is nine bits. Little tiny time frame. Nine bits of data is all you get to see out of 10,000 brain cells firing within you. And that nine bits of data is the guide for your journey through the world. It's been estimated in that same time frame, which is about a 25th of a second, where those 10,000 brain cells are firing and there are nine measurable units of electrical activity that go into perception. It's been estimated in the same time frame, there are approximately 20 trillion bits of data going on in the world. So here you are in a 20 trillion bit world, with 10,000 brain cells firing and seeing nine bits of data. And the nine bits of data is the light or the guide for your earthly life, for your journey through this 20 trillion bit world. So when he says the eye is the lamp of the soul, he's not talking about your eyeball. He's saying the perceptual world, the world that you see, the tiny time frame that you see is designed to guide you through this whole process of life. And then he says, if the, the, the Greeks tell us, he says, if the light for you is darkness, let's go to the Aramaic. He says, if your perception, that guide, is based in darkness, and in Aramaic, darkness is hostility or fear, 
then how deep will your darkness become? Anybody here ever done something you regret? Okay. Go back to one time when you did something that today you regret it. And then identify what you were feeling that motivated you to do what you regret. Put a word to that feeling and share it with us. What were you feeling that motivated you to do what today you regret? Fear. Frustration. Frustration. Hostility. Hostility. Anger. Anger. Now, this is another question that Jeannie and I have asked of tens of tens of thousands of people all over the globe. And 100% of the time, everybody's answer was a word that in Aramaic represents darkness, some form of hostility or fear. If hostility or fear is the guide for you, then how deep will your darkness become? What kind of crazy behaviors when your perceptual mind is plugged into hostility or fear have you done? When the light has been extracted, when active presence of love, the power supply for your human mind has been disappeared, what kind of crazy things have you done in your world? So the first key is to understand that what he was saying is your perceptual mind is designed to function plugged into love. If you unplug it from its power supply, it's dead in the water. Anybody got a device in your home, your car, your office, your shop, your kitchen, that if you unplug it from its power supply works really well? There is no such device, and the human mind is no different. It is literally designed to be plugged into love 24-7, 365. It is literally designed to be powered by your human presence. And the world is specialized in knocking our human presence out of us and sending us out into the world to look for someone to love us, which is an impossibility. Bad news. Nobody has ever loved you. Nobody is ever going to love you. You have never loved anyone, and you are never going to love you, and God does not love you. That's a lie. That's not true. You've been taught love is a verb, something God's going to do to you, or something somebody else is going to do to you, or something you're going to do to somebody else. No, love is a noun. It's what you are. It's what the Creator is. You live, move, and have your being in an energy field called love. It doesn't love you. It is love. You can't love another. You are love. When you function out of love in relationship, then you do the things we call loving. But if you're trying to love them, you've just been set up for failure. If there's hostility or fear in you, as we did demonstrate in our workshop this afternoon, if there's hostility or fear in you, then there is literally an energy field reaching out into the world, a literal measurable energy field that will draw somebody to you who knows how to resonate or activate your hostility or fear. And if you've been given this goal of trying to do love when somebody shows up to resonate your rage or your fear, you're going to fail. And you're going to judge yourself as though there's something wrong with you because you didn't follow that rule. That's not a rule. That's a falsity. Stop trying to love anybody. Now, give somebody the goal of being love in another's presence, of re regrouping and reconnecting with themselves as the active presence of love, and then if somebody comes and resonates your rage or your fear, then your striving is not to love them, but to be restored to love as a human being. Now you've got something you can accomplish. Change the meaning of words, you can destroy the culture. First key in Yeshua's teachings, recognize that your perception is the guide. You get nine bits of data to guide you through this 20 trillion bit world. Make sure your lights are on. Make sure you're connected to love. Second key, second thing to understand is the following or the understanding of the first law. And the first law was maintain Rachma. When you maintain Rachma, you keep your lights on. You keep your mind plugged into the presence of your human life. And it now has a proper power supply. So Rachma is a filter in the frontal lobes of the brain. When they said to him, what, what's most important in the law? He did not say, love your neighbor. He said, maintain rachma in the presence of the neighbor or the creator. And that gateway being open allows human life, the presence of love, the being that you are, to be maintained in human form. 
So he's saying, keep that gateway open. Keep Rachma open in your mind. And then you have a gateway for human life to enter your human form. So second key in Yeshua's teaching is understand this thing that there is no concept for in Aramaic, or pardon me, in Greek, in uh, English or Latin, the languages that our you know, scriptural roots tend to come from. Maintain Rachma. Maintain that gateway that allows you to function as the active presence of love. Third key is the most important tool that Yeshua taught. And the most important tool I would offer is the tool of forgiveness. As I said earlier, that word's been changed. We've been told that you did something terrible that caused all this pain inside of me, but it's okay, I'll be big about it, I'll forgive you. I'll let you off the hook for what's going on inside of me. If hostility or fear is moving inside of me and I let you off the hook for that fact, have I done anything to address or change my hostility or fear? Absolutely nothing. And people go through experience after experience after experience after experience, playing out the family dynamic, what we call a power person dynamic, and never knowing how to remove that dynamic because they think the reason they're in the state they're in is because of somebody else. They believe the lie that somebody else caused this to happen in them. And in believing the lie that somebody else caused this to happen in them, they let them off the hook like it's their fault that I'm experiencing something. Whenever I think that someone else is doing something to me that I am doing with my own mind, I am living in a state of denial. And in a state of denial, I have to hide the part of my mind with which I'm causing my pain. And now I can't get free of my pain because I'm believing that it comes from outside of me. And to believe that, I have to hide it from myself. Forgiveness is the tool with which you collapse perceptions based in hostility and fear. And when they collapse, they collapse in on themselves and give you access to the underlying source of the pain that most people have been hiding from themselves. When you have access to the underlying source of the pain and you bring the source of that pain forward to awareness in the presence of love, that pain in the presence of love dissolves. It disappears. And the diseases associated with that pain disappear instantly. It's not about a miracle. I mean, it's a miracle. It's a miracle that anything happens. But the fact that someone heals is not a miraculous process. If you understand how the process works, then you engage in the process. And healing is a natural result. The only way we can be diseased is by holding an energy in tissue that does not belong in tissue, that interferes with and interrupts the flow of energy in the cell. If I know how to forgive, if I know how to re reach in and remove what never belonged in the cell, the cell instantly, instantly snaps back to its normal state and healing occurs. But as long as I hold to the hostility and fear that distorts and destroys the cell, then I live in a space where I cannot heal my disorders or my diseases. You know, the, the, an interesting thing about the human mind, when you realize that it's Harvard research that says 10,000 measurable units of electric activity, you get to see nine bits. What you're getting to see is evidence. And the only evidence you ever get to see is evidence of your own BS. That's belief system. Does, does somebody have a different reality for those initials? <laughs> if you have a different reality for those initials, I'll ask you to take responsibility and notice that's your reality, not mine. That's belief system, literally. Your mind cannot show you evidence that you do not give it permission to show you. So if you're always talking about how they made you mad, they made you sad, they made you afraid, they hurt you, then your mind has to say, well, here's how the instruction set goes to the evidential mind. I'm hurting and I'm blaming someone else. Mind, I realize that we have this thing called hurt, but you know, we don't own those things for ourselves in our family system. We always blame somebody else. Would you build me a perception? Would you build me a structure in my mind that shows me that somebody else is responsible for my pain? Now I get 
a darkened perception based in my hostility or fear pointing the finger at them. And my perception is degraded by the actual fact that I allowed hostility or fear to come into building that guidance system. Forgiveness allows me to go under the surface to discover the root of everything that is off base in my life and remove it. I'm in charge of that process. I can't change it if I believe somebody else is. So that's the third key. The fourth, the fourth key is the most important block that you need to know how to deal with. And the most important block, the thing that can stop you living as a human being, is Satan. You've got to understand this dude called Satan, or at least the Greeks called him a dude. But you know, in Aramaic, the word Satan is a lowercase word. It's not an uppercase word, and it's not the name of a being or a creature. In Aramaic, the word Satan means, here's another word that's been changed to make sure we don't understand. The word Satan means the resistor, one who misleads. Now, you'll notice with the average person who's about blaming somebody else, if you go into a conversation and tell them they're responsible, if you remind them that they've been through this 87 different times with 42 different people, what do they do? They go into resistance and say, no, not me. And then they tell you their story about someone else. The resistor, one who misleads, is Satan, not the dude with the red suit, the tail, and the pitchfork. The fifth and final key of Yeshua is the most important request to make. The patterns we tend to follow are patterns of the generations that have so much energy behind them, so much inertia behind them, that their direction is difficult to change with our puny human faculties, with a nine-bit mind. If you're looking at something that's a thousand generations old in your bloodline, to change that with this m minuscule amount of awareness that you have in your human mind is virtually impossible. Yeshua taught about a feminine elemental force that existed in us that when invited into activity undoes the effects of our errors and teaches us the truth. The words that, were rep that represent that force in Aramaic are ruka de kudsha. Rucha being a word that represents the elemental forces, de kudsha being that which is proper for humans, the root of the word kosher. So there is literally inside of every one of us, built in from the beginning, an elemental force that will support our human lives if we ask for support. But you've got free will, and it's not going to interfere with your free will. People go around, I mean, I hear people all the time, oh, how terrible is this God that would allow war and, you know, divorce and child abuse to exist? As though the Creator's got anything to do with it. Creator's nothing whatsoever to do with what we humans are doing. The Creator said, I'm turning the game over to you. You've got free will. Do what you choose. And most people get locked into decisions and have no idea what a choice is. And their decisions are simply a replicate of the past. Replicate mind just runs and runs and runs. If we want to let loose of the replicate mind, there is a power in us, and a modern word for that, ruka de kutcha, we could say, and the, the words been translate, were translated by the Greeks as the Holy Spirit. No disembodied spirit being. We could say in our modern understanding with computer understanding of how energy systems work, we could call this super processor. There's an elemental force in you that knows how to handle all of the energy that has ever gone on in your generations and shift it and change it if you want it to be changed. But you're the one with free will. You get to do what you want. And if you don't invite that power to go to work in you, then you'll get to stay where you are. So the fifth and final key that Yeshua gave us was that there, where you are in a place where you seem helpless to change the flow of energy that is so big and so charged and so emotional that 
you just can't seem to control it, there's a power in you called Rukha de Kutcha that if you ask her, will remove it, literally. You know, when he was talking to uh, one of the elders from the temple, he's talking about this Rukha de Kutcha, and the elder's like, what are you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. And he says, what, you, one of the elders, you don't understand this? And then he uses an elemental force that they do know. He talks about the wind. And he instructs him on these elemental forces. He said, you don't know where the wind came from. You don't know where the wind went. But you know by its effects, it's been here. You cannot know these elemental forces directly. But if you start inviting her into activity, if you're in the middle of your muddle, and you ask whatever word you use to address this power, it's been called the higher power, the superconscious, the subconscious, the primordial ex, the Holy Spirit, in Aramaic, Ruka de Kutcha. Whatever term you use, if you ask her for support and then watch, you won't know where she came from, you won't know where she went, but you'll know by the effects that she's been here. Because all of a sudden, issues that perhaps have hung around in your life for decades will dissipate and disappear. This man knew exactly there's a, a total coherent system of understanding how to heal ourselves and move out of this non-human realm of hostility or fear. Replug ourselves back into the presence of love and undo everything in us that is less than love. You are designed, I would offer, to function as a human being. Hold the newborn if you ever forget who you are. You are the awesome active presence of love. And I join you in living as that. Thank you.